There we go. Yes, recording. Everybody's in, everybody's in, and go. PSA, before we um, start this thing, please get vaccinated. If you are unvaccinated, that's all I got. Don't care what your political side you are. Just get a vaccine so we can get this thing over with. Most majority of our patients in the hospital are unvaccinated patients. So if you guys don't know, I still work in the hospital, Spring Valley ICU, and this is what we have. This is what we're dealing with. So please get your vaccine. If you have any questions on the vaccine, you can look it up, ask me or anybody else. That is my PSA for today. So to this week's topic, is about bugs and cancer. Introduction to cell psychology. You guys can read this if you wish. It's there, it's part of the package. It's part of the PowerPoint slides they give me. So that's nice and cute and pretty. You can look it up for the anatomy uh, geeks. This is probably not enough information for you but I just want to get to the drug part. Diffusion, cytoplasm, osmosis. There we go. All right, now let's talk about some drugs, antiprotozoal drugs agents. First, I'm going to talk about risk factors for protozoal infections. Sanitations, unsanitary crowd, uh, mainly in third world countries where it's overpopulated, there's no running water, there's no electricity, uh, people pee and poop at the side of the road or wherever they want because it's not available. So these guys are highly susceptible for uh, protozoal infections. It does poor hygiene. So these guys don't have a good proper hygiene practices because it's not available to them. Although here in America, we have hot water, electricity, everything else, but we still have people who are having, who have poor hygienic practices. If that's the case, hey, that's your thing. But just keep in mind that you will, you're high risk for some, uh, to get some infections. Other causes. Insect bites, malaria, and look at these. Uh, this red one down here is, is the sand fly. I'm not sure which country this is in. And this, uh, I think this is the triposomniasis, which is uh, caused by this bug. I'll get to that here in a few seconds. Other causes of protozoal infections, GI. My mouse, GI, amoebiasis, GR, giardiasis in the GI tract. And also this thing right here, I've never heard of it before. It's, oops, it's, uh, I guess it's kind of like an SCD, trichomoniasis. It's a sexually transmitted infection caused by a parasite. Again, that goes into, into the uh, hygiene and um, I can't even imagine. So these antiprotozoal drugs, what do they do? What are, why are we talking about it? Because about half a million people die from this, uh, and, uh, from this protozoal infection, bugs, every year. So it will not be uncommon to see these patients. You will, you're probably gonna be administering these medications when you, once you become a nurse. They inhibit protein DNA synthesis in susceptible protozoa. It pretty much kills them. It stops them from mutating, advancing. Work. Work, there we go. Just like any other drugs we've talked about, metabolizes in the liver, excreted in the, kid in the kidneys, and in these cases, the poop. In general, contraindications for antiprotozoal drugs, of course, allergies, pregnancies, CNS disease, because uh, this also goes up to the brain. The, the, its main action is in the liver and in the brain. 
So if somebody has uh, CNS issues, uh, this may not work out for them. Hepatic disease, because it is, um, um, it goes into the uh, liver. Adverse effect, generic adverse effect, headaches, dizziness, ataxia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This, this is an important part of the slide. Take a picture, take a screenshot, whatever you need to do, because you need to know this. Antiprotozoal drugs interacts with alcohol, anticoagulants, and uh, desulfiram, which is um, antabuse. I don't have to tell you what alcohol is. I'm looking at some cups there by the computer. Some of you might even have it at the side of your computer, which is okay. Um, anticoagulants, these drugs are does not work well with patients on anticoagulation, from Coumadin to Eloquis, whatever um, anticoagulation drugs they're, uh, they're in, or heparin if they're in the hospital. The sulforam or antabuse, if you're not familiar with this drug, this is the alcoholic drug. If I'm an alcoholic and I want to quit, I cannot do it physically, I cannot do it with this, I just can't, then the physician will prescribe me this medication, antabuse. I'm gonna take this medication and, um, and live my life. And if I do decide to take a drink, this medicine is gonna cause me to get sick, headache, nausea, vomiting, chest pain, weakness, confusion, choking, difficulty breathing. So it's really, really bad if you're on this medication and you decide to take a drink. So these three are contraindicated, or it interacts with our antiprotozoal agents. Next, malaria. Let's talk about this little bug, this uh, mosquito, related to the destruction of red blood cells and toxic to the liver. Those are the two main points where malaria brews, cooks, and where it spread in the blood. The treatment aims at attacking parasite at the various stages of its development inside and outside the human body. I don't know, I think the outside the human body, you can kind of pop, that's it, they're dead. But, so I had to look this one up and it's pretty interesting how this malaria spreads. Over here to the right is a mosquito. They, they sting you, they bite you. And when they do, they inject this uh, parasite into your blood. This parasite in your blood gets to your liver, which they like. It's nice and comfortable for them. And once they are in the liver, they, they cook and mature and turn into something else. And this something else, merozite, gets into your RBCs. Once it gets to your blood, then it starts cycling within your body. And the, the next mosquito that's going to bite you sucks this from you. And then once they get into their mosquito's blood, it cooks in their body. And then it passes them on again to the next patient, to the next person. So this is why half a million people die from malaria every year. A little under half a million. The first one right there. Plasmodium falciparum, it is the most dangerous type of, uh, of malaria. If you go down the list, milder form, mild symptoms, rarely seen, we don't care much about those, but this one up top, plasmodium falciparum, because this is what kills those half a million people. Um, Antiprotozoa across the lifespan. With the children, they are very sensitive to this drug and they have more severe reaction to it. And with the adults, let's go to the older adults first. Just like with any other drugs that we're using that are toxic, they are more susceptible to the adverse effect of this medication. Next, let's go to the adults, us. The question is, if I'm going to the Sahara Desert to fulfill my lifelong dream of roaming with the tigers and the cheetahs and the lions and, and the giraffes, I'm gonna go camping and right in the smack that middle of the Sahara Desert and um, be one with these lions. Do I need, the question is, should you take a prophylactic, 
consists of um, antiprotozoa treatment against malaria before you go to Africa? Or should you just, should you not do it? And if you do get it, come back here to the United States and we'll give you the treatment for it. Pop quiz, the answer is the CDC. Shoot. The CDC recommends, highly recommends you take a, um, a prophylaxis for um, anti-malarial, um, for anti-malarial, for malaria. Um, it specifically lists the type and the regimen of prophylaxis you need to take depending on the country or the region where you are going. And if that's the case, you're going to, I don't know, let's say Zimbabwe, you can download this thing and take it to your physician and tell him, Dr. Bobby, I'm going to Zimbabwe and uh, it says uh, I need to be on this medicine. Good. He'll write you the prescription for it and you go on your way. Hopefully it's enough to cover you from, um, from the parasite. Excuse me, is the malaria part of the yellow card that you get if you're traveling abroad? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Is that the WHO card? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm going to have to look that one up. Okay. I want to know too, because I'm about to go somewhere, not in Zimbabwe, but I'm curious. Drugs. Let's talk about anti malarial drugs. Quinine, qualiquin. First drug found effective in the treatment of malaria. It is absent from the market for a while, but now available for treating uncomplicated malaria. Next, you probably heard the next one, hydrochloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug. It was a hot topic last year from, I don't know, I'm going to guess March until May, June-ish, that it was quoted, it was uh, labeled as the treatment for uh, COVID. It's not, never has, never will. I don't know if never will, but it's never worked. So um, it's like somebody, uh, oh, was she here? No, okay, never mind. So uh, if you see, see that as a test question, consider it a freebie. And all these other ones, chloroquine, mefloquine, primaquine, pyrimethamine, eh, it's okay, but I'm mainly focused on the first two, especially that second one that gave false hope to these people that they're gonna get better and okay, I'm gonna move on before I get mad. And time, um, indications, malaria. That's what we use them for. If you have malaria, we're gonna give you this. Um, how it does is remember these bacteria, these, uh, uh, these parasites get into your bloodstream, into your RBCs, and that's what the other mosquitoes suck and pass on to the next patient. So what these anti-malarials do is stop or prevent uh, these, this from happening. So when your mosquito sucks blood from you, they are sucking out clean blood, which so they can't pass it on. Absorbed in a GI tract, concentrated liver, spleen, kidney, and brain. Brain, that's why uh, you need to know that. You need to know that it affects the brain and it goes to the brain. Uh, contraindications. These contraindications for these, these types of medications are almost the same. Allergies, of course, liver disease, because that's where it is metabolized. A, plus, that's where it goes, because that's where these bacteria are, these uh, parasites are. Alcoholism, I talked about that already. Pregnancy and lactation, no, for these uh, pregnant women. Ah, uh, there it is again. Brain keeps showing up, adverse effects, CNF, CNS effects, GI effects, hepatic dysfunction, and dermatological. 
Let me see here, drug to drug interactions for these anti-malarials are, because sometimes we use this in combination with the other medicine. And if we do that, there, we might get successful, we should get successful in treating the malaria, but there's an incre increased risk for cardiac toxicity, convulsions, and antifolate drugs are also uh, interact with this. Other antiprotozoal agents include atavaquone, mepron. This is especially effective against PCP. If you're not familiar with the PCP, it is a pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. It's a pneumonia very specific to the AIDS patient. So, um, and this is that mepron is what we use for it. You probably, half of you have probably administered flagyl metrodianazinol diazole in the hospital, either in a pill form or the IV piggyback form. It treats GI issues, GI parasites. Next, pentamidine, another one for the uh, PCP, pneumocystis carinii. What's so special about this one? It's so special that it killed my mouse. This one is nebulized. They put it, the respiratory therapist administers this medication. It is one of the few antibiotics that they administer. Probably the, not, and not antibiotic, actually they do. One of the few antiprotozoa they administer. And um, they, it's a nebulized treatment for the AIDS patient who has the PCP. So if I'm talking about antiprotozoal agents that's nebulized, whatever the storyline might say, this is the only one. Okay. We also nebulize antibiotics, but for the antiprotozoal, this is it. Uh, the tinidazole or tindamax is the treatment for that sexually transmitted uh, uh, protozoal infection. And also for the kids, benznidazole 9, a vector for the Chagas disease, vector borne parasitic disease caused by the bite of a triatimone bug. I don't know what continent, what country this is uh, uh, from. I feel like I've seen these bugs in rice before, but um, it's for uh, pediatric patients. And that is the malarial, anti malarial or antiprotozoal uh, anti agents. Short, quick, it's not much there. Now let's talk about my, the worms, anthelmintic agents. There are the type of medicine that kills helminths. Helminths are worm-like parasites, such as flukes, roundworms, tapeworms. It is important that the anthelmintics are selectively toxic only to the parasite and not the host. There's two types that infect the humans. Nematodes, pinworms, whipworms, threadworms, all kinds of worms. And uh, plethi helmets or flatworms. What's the difference? These worms invade the intestine. Pinworms, whipworms, threadworms, helmets, cestodes, I can't even pronounce that. These are in a GI tract. This is what causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bad news. Sometimes, but then there's also the, um, the tissue invading infections. Uh, this one goes under the skin, tr trichinosis. This one goes, uh, this picture I found, it was a uh, house and the foot. She's, and these ones are, I think it's in the uh, Southeast Asia from the uh, rice farmers. It's where they get them because of the water and uh, their hand in it, in the mud. Mainly found in the tropical regions. 
Let's skip this one. Use of anthelmintic agents across the lifespan. Let me talk about kids. Cultures must be done first because this medication, these types of medications are highly toxic. It should be avoided in children. And if we do have to use it on them, we need cultures to make sure it is what we're dealing with. In the adults, it's more of a psychological thing for adults because if I tell somebody, if I tell my patient, Samantha, that Samantha, I'm giving you this medicine because you have worm in your stomach and they're mainly disgusted that they have this thing inside them and it becomes a psychological thing issue for them. And uh, for the older adults, they're more susceptible to the CNS and GI side effects of these medications. Uh, I think I'm gonna name about three or four of these medications. Albendazole, uh, actions treats active lesions caused by pork tapeworm, cystic disease of the liver, and, and uh, caused by peritoneum, caused by dog tapeworm. I'm not sure if this is related to kissing your dog or something, but take it as is. Contraindications for this medications, same as all the other ones. Mm, one thing about this medicine is the drug-to-drug -drug interactions of dexamethasone, your steroids, praziquantel, which is another one of these worm medications, and cimetidine, your GI medicine, or tagamet. Ivermectin, you, you may see this in the hospital depending on the, what you're treating your patient, um, what the patient is in for, because we also use this for other stuff, not specifically for this, because the action for this is effective against nematodes that causes uh, onchocerciasis or river blindness. It is when there's a worm inside your eyeball. We don't see that in a hospital, at least here in the U.S. Um, at least here in, in my hospital, at least. We don't see that. Yeah, I mean, probably exists somewhere else, but we also use this drug for something else, uh, some other uh, bacteria that we might be fighting. So in case you see this, medications, medication, ivermectin, um, it's typically ordered by the infectious disease control, um, infectious disease uh, uh, physician, because they know what bacteria they are um, dealing with. Um, so look at that. Just imagine having a worm inside your eye. Mm. Contraindications for this, same as the other one, same as the effect. Next. Mebendazole, most, most commonly used of all the anthelmintics. Most commonly used out of all the anthelmintics. Maybe I should say it one more time. It is the most commonly used out of the all anthelmintics. Effective against, you see the list there, pinworms, roundworms, pretty much all the worms is going to be inside your, your belly or under your skin if you have it under your skin. Contraindications, look, it's the same. They all have the same or virtually the same. Allergy, pregnancy, renal hepatic disease, that's almost the same. Next is praziquantel bilitricide. This is for uh, treatment of schistomo schistomos or flukes. Look at this, it, the legs, it's they have spots all over their legs. They, uh, it's under the skin. You have, just imagine you have these worms, you have these parasites under your skin, and this is what you get for it. Biltricide. Side effects should be, contraindications should be all virtually the same for all of these medications. Pharmacokinetics, peak levels, you don't need to know all this. Eh, I'm not going to test you on that. If this was a heparin or cardiac drug, I will, but not for something you will rarely see.
Oh, this one is a special one. You should take note of that when I say that. Pyrantel. Ah, oh, I should have looked it up. I said earlier, I wasn't sure because this is a over-the-counter anti-myth been red, been X. If you've seen this over the counter, let me know. Cause I don't know. I don't have a kid. I'm, my kid is five, two. So uh, oral drug effective against pinworms and roundworms given as a single dose. Pop, give me this. If I have some worms in my belly and the worm dies, worm dies. I poop, poop out the worm and we all live happily ever after. Good, but look at this. Uh, this works well, but we cannot use it for kids under two years old. And, and these are the kids eating dirt, eating stuff, and they may have stuff in their belly and you need to get out. And so you can't use this, you need to kill, but you can't use this on these under two year old babies. It's a hard no. Adverse effect, same. Managing pinworm infections. Keep the nail short, hands clean. Looks like this is uh, what we're using, doing now for uh, COVID. Shower in the AM. Hmm, I don't know. Some of us like to shower twice a day. Before you get out, come back. Before you go to bed, come when you, when you get home. I don't know. I guess this is me. I want to wash off the COVID when I'm inside the house. Uh, change and launder undergarments, bed linens, pajamas, disinfect toilet seat daily. Wash hands after the bathroom. Basic stuff. Nothing special. All right. This is the highlight of the hour chemotherapy chemotherapy an aggressive form of chemical drug therapy meant to destroy rapidly growing cells in the body it is usually used to treat cancer as cancers grow as cancer cells grow and divide faster than other cells we zap the cancer cells next thing you know they're back zap back zap back that's not a good circle of life story. Whoa, what happened? Okay. Uh, types of cancer, solid tumors or in the blood. Carcinomas is a type of cancer that starts in the cells, um, mainly usually in the skin or tissue lining organs, such as livers or kidneys. Sarcomas, a rare type of cancer that grows in connective tissues like the bones, nerves, muscle, tendons, cartilage, blood vessels of the arms and the legs. Hematological, that kind of explains itself, itself, blood. Causes of cancer, genetic predisposition, viral infection, constant irritation and cell turnover, stress, didn't know cancer. Stress causes cancer. Oh. Lifestyle factors. Yes, you have uh, environmental factors. Coal miners is uh, one I can think of. All those asbestos, people who work in the ceiling or in the roof from the, ho from the houses in the 60s or something. Let's do some terminologies. As abnormal cells continue to divide, they lose more and more of their original cells, character, cell characteristics, and they exhibit the following. First terminology, anaplasia. Cancerous cells lose cellular differentiation and organization, unable to function normally. Next, autonomy. Cancerous cells grow without the usual homeostatic restrictions that regulate cell growth. They're like super cells, super bad cells. This allows cells to form a tumor. Next, one you're gonna hear a lot if you've probably heard it already, METS, metastasis. Cancer cells travel from the place of origin to develop new tumors in other areas of the body. 
my, if I have a patient that has cancer in the, let's say liver, meds to the lungs. Now we have to put you on a ventilator because your lungs is not working anymore because there's cancer there now. And then meds to the brain. And now you're brain dead or you're neurologically uh, compromised because the cancer cells are eating up your brain. So pretty much at that point, what we recommend, usually recommend is palliative care. Because yes, it's uh, you have cancer in the liver, meds to the lungs, meds to the brain. It's not gonna get any better. It's not gonna clear up, it's not gonna go away. We can zap it with ra radiation, it's gonna come back. And um, that's not a good outcome for these patients. Angiogenesis abnormal cells release enzymes to generate blood vessels and supply oxygen and nutrient to the cells, generating growth, just like the other one, super cells that are developing, overdeveloping, pretty much taking over the good cells. The goals of cancer treatment, let's kill them. Let's kill the cancer. Step one, I need surgery. Let's remove uh, my breast cancer, let's remove the breast, take out the surgery, take out the cancer, and hopefully that's it. In some cases, that's not it. Stimulation of the immune system to destroy them, okay? Radiation therapy, zap them, zap them, zap them, then they come back or spread quickly. Drug therapy to kill them during various phases of the cell cycle, which is what we're talking about now, the drug therapy. There's, there's many, many, many cancer drugs out there, but we will be focusing on three to four. Here's the first two, doxorubicin. Rubex or cis, and cisplatin, platinol AQ. In general, chemotherapy drugs alter cellular function by disrupting cell, it kills them. It kills the cancer cells. They prevent cell, cell, cellular reproduction, eventually leading to cell death. That is a good description, perfect description, but it doesn't always work that way. I wish if, if we would have less people with cancer if that's the case. Other things it does are destroy organisms that invade the body from different kinds of bacteria or fungus. It also destroys abnormal cells within the body, neoplasms or cancers. So here's my cancer cells. These uh, chemotherapy drugs, they will kill these cancer cells. But my normal cell on the left side, it's nice and cute, it's pretty, but it's not safe. Chemo is like a nuclear bomb. Once we set it off, it not just kills the bad cells and also the good cells. So everything dies or most of it dies. So with this medication, doxorubicin, this is our first drug. This is toxic. Actually, all of these medications are toxic. They're mainly, um, they focus... They're toxic on three types of um, cells that they, they tend to focus on. One is the hair cells. They seem to attack the hair cells immediately as, uh, as they get in the uh, body. The hair cells, the skin cells, and also the bone cells. Why is that? Because these cells are the fastest growing cells in the body. Since it's attacking these cells, you already know what the side effects are gonna be. Number one, if it's attacking my hair cells, I'm gonna get bald. Number two, if it's attacking my skin cells, my skin is gonna get weak and brittle. Next, if it's attacking my bone cells, I'm gonna have some bone marrow suppression. Mm, you need to know about my bone marrow suppression uh, side effect because it is the most deadly out of all of them. 
who cares if I don't have hair, if my skin is brittle, but bone marrow suppression, this changes the game for these patients. So what's so special about these, uh, our bone? Because our bone produces the red blood cells, platelets, white blood cells, whatever other cells are in our body. It comes from the bone. So when uh, there's a bone marrow suppression, then it doesn't produce these things anymore. Now my red blood cells get lower. Now my platelets are low. White blood cells are low. I am in trouble. It will significantly, significantly lower my immunity level from low to none. Effects of bone marrow suppressions. I talked about this. Low RBC and CBCs. If I don't have much blood to get around, then I don't have it. Next, low platelets. Less than 100,000 is thrombocytopenia. What does that mean? That sounds like a technical term. Bleeding. These are the little platelets that patch up the little hole if I'm bleeding. If I don't have these uh, platelets, there's nothing there to patch up my bleeding. So I'm going to keep on bleeding. That's why if you have a patient um, who's thrombocytopenic, they'll probably, you'll probably see signs on, inside the room uh, that says like high risk for bleeding or something like that. Next, low WBC. WBC, we look at it. I know when you're doing your paperwork, WBC is up. They have an infection. Yes, good, good job. But what does it actually do? The WBCs fight the infection. The WBC is up in this specific patient because they're fighting the infection. In this case, with our cancer patient's case, and there's nothing. The WBC is so low that they cannot fight the infection. What does that mean? My immunity for my patient's immunity for any type of, um, of uh, bacteria is zero. So a, com a cold, can, which is a very minor bacteria, can kill me because I don't have the, I, the, the WBC to protect me from it. What do I need to know? What do you need to know as a nurse? Avoid cuts. If you're going to shave, please use a shaver because your platelets are low, one little bitty cut. You might be oozing blood, and then now you're losing blood. Oh, shoot, poop. You're, you're losing blood, and your blood count is already low. Houston, we have a problem. Next, bearing down to poop. I do not want you to bear down when you're pooping, Mr. Jones, because uh, it increase, you might break some micro blood vessels within your, uh, in your brain, in your lower GI tract. One of the most important ones, no falls. Because I have this patient who is thrombocytopenic and they fall, bad combination. Because if my patient falls, they bump their head and now I have blood in my brain. And if so, there's no way, it's gonna, I don't wanna say no way, it is gonna be very difficult to stop this bleeding inside my brain. And once my brain starts filling up with blood, let me take you back to anatomy. Here's your skull, inside is the brain. Now my brain is uh, filling, my head is filling in with blood. The blood is gonna push my brain out of the way because it doesn't know the difference. And when it does push my brain out of the way, it's pushing it to my spinal canal. When it does that, it's called herniation. We, herniation is synonymous with the term dead. You are dead if your brain herniates. So no falls, no type of, especially head injury on these patients. Priority. Fever is a priority for these patients on chemotherapy drugs. If their temperature is 100.3 Fahrenheit or 38 centigrade, 
it's bad. Any other patient? If I have a fever 103, I'll probably just sit on the couch, eat some ice cream and do nothing, watch TV. But for these patients, it is a priority because it tells us that the patient has some kind of infection and it needs to be addressed stat, like five minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. Uh, get this guy a cooling blanket. Let's get some Tylenol on board. I need to get this temperature down. If you're, uh, as a new nurse, you may not know what to do. Best thing you can do is call Dr. Jones, your cancer patient, Mrs. Smith. Temperature is 100.5. Oh, damn. All uh, right, let's get some blood cultures going, get some Tylenol, Q6, um, do something. Because it's bad news. I talked about that already. Um, look, if they're leukop they have leukopenia with low WBCs, oh, they're going to be on what we call a, um, a reverse isolation. You've heard, you've seen patients in the hospital who are in, I forgot the COVID isolation. It's a blue sign, like a special isolation, I think, for the COVID. You also have contact isolations, airborne isolations. This is neutropenic isolations, or other places call it reverse isolations. It means we're not bringing anything, we don't wanna bring anything into that patient. Unlike the other isolations, I don't wanna bring your, I don't wanna take your C. diff with me. I don't wanna take your KPC with me, your whatever else with me and take it home and spread it around. In this case, I do not want to give you any type of bacteria that may possibly kill you because your immunity level is zero. Next, another uh, nursing consideration with this medication is it, it causes, it lo lowers insulin sensitivity. Not like the, um, so not like the, who was that? The glucocorticosteroids where their blood sugar, it will shoot up. So they need to adjust this, their medications with the steroids. But in this case, it's not that much of a jump. It does not need to change. We don't need to change the insulin regimen or dosage of any uh, diabetic medications. What you can do for them is monitor their blood sugar frequently. And if you are seeing a um, rise or it's slowly creeping up, then hey, maybe we do need to make some uh, adjustments. So that's what it means when we uh, say, ta -ta -ta -ta, I'm typing, 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 we'll continue to monitor right there, we'll continue to monitor. I'm not doing anything about it now, but we'll see what happens on the next check four hours from now. Another thing you need to consider about these patients, um, remember it causes my, uh, this medication causes my, it attacks my hair cells, my skin cells. It makes my skin very thin and fragile. So what's, here's a no-no for these patients. No rectal, temps, no rectal temperature checks on these patients. It can perforate the lining of the rectum because it's thin and fragile. That's how weak their skin gets. It is very sensitive. What else do you wanna know? You're a chemo nurse. Actually, you can just be a nurse nurse. You're administering this medication. One of the most common side effects of chemo is nausea and vomiting. That's almost like a common knowledge um, of side effect of chemo. So if you're giving this uh, patient chemo medication and the patient starts getting nauseated, starts vomiting, what you need to do is stop the infusion and give my patient Zofran, on the Sertron. This is, remember, this is the uh, post-op nausea vomiting medication. And it's also used for chemo, nausea, and vomiting. 
I think it's one in, in one of the drug cards, either for post-op or chemo. Next medication, next chemo drug is cisplatin. Works the same as the other medicate as other chemo drug, but this one, cisplatin, is focused on. For some reason, it likes the kidneys. It likes to attack the kidneys. It's nephrotoxic. So if if I have a drug that's nephrotoxic, these are the assessments I need to do to my patients. I need to monitor their their INOs. If I'm drinking two liters of fluid a day, and I'm only peeing 500 a day, that might be a problem. That means my kidneys are not working to, for me to flush out what I drank. It should be around, or right around in the same ballpark range. If, um, so monitor the eyes and O's. Next, creatine, creatinine. More than 1.3 equals bad kidneys. Okay. Next, BUN. I mentioned this earlier. Please don't say BUN. It's not, it's, I mean, don't say, I hear bun a lot. What is the bun? What is the bun? I said earlier, bun to me is a, is like a, it's a pastry with meat inside and it's tasty and it's yummy. So there's no bun. It's B-U-N, blood, urethra, nitrogen. Learn the language, learn the lingo, speak the language. So anything more than 20 is bad. That means my kidneys are starting to go bad. Urine output, 30 mLs or less, means my kidneys are starting to get in trouble. It's going to be very difficult to, uh, to monitor urine, hourly urine output in a med surge setting. So typically these patients go, if I need to monitor their yeah, urine output hourly, they will have to go to a critical care, maybe an IMC level where the patient ratio is lower and I can be more, uh, almost like one-on-one -on -one with my patient. I need more time with the patient if I'm gonna do this. Because uh, if it's starting to, to lower, then I may need to notify, in these cases, nephrology is on board. And so that's what I'm gonna call. So what, what do I need to do for this medication? Though this medication is also a little different. Um, before with the other medication, you want, if they're nauseated, they're vomiting, you wanna stop it and give them the uh, Zofran. In this case, I want to administer this anti-emetic before we even start with this treatment, because we already we already know it's going to happen. Technically, you can do that um, with the uh, other medications, but for this one, it specifically says that please give my patient Zofran before we start the treatment. Saline rinse before and after meals for the mouth. It uh, it soothes mucositis pain that that they get. Here's another one. I want to increase the fluid intake for the next three days because for the most part, these patients getting chemo, they are dehydrated. And I want to make sure they're fully hydrated because I know their kidneys are going to take a toll. They're going to take a hit and I need to make sure they are fully hydrated. Teach the patient how to manage fatigue. Sounds like a... Uh, a generic statement for all the chemo drugs. Hydration is the key for cisplatin because it's highly toxic to the liver, I mean kidneys. So hydration, cisplatin equals hydration. Hydration equals cisplatin. How, do I, how am I gonna monitor that if I'm working at the cancer center? I don't have all these fancy squiggly lines, hourly I's and O's. I don't have all these gadgetries that they have in the hospital. One way I can monitor my uh, hydration is BP. It's right there. BP, if my blood pressure is 60 over 30, you know I don't have, I don't have volume in my body. So I probably need volume. Give me some IV fluids. 
if my blood pressure is 140 over 89, then ah, I'm fully hydrated. Keep it coming. Keep, I, I'm, I can do this. Turger. Pop, pop, pop. This is not part of our quick assessment that we do to the patient. It's specific to the uh, to nephrologist. We also do it if we need to check it. That's not wrong to check the patient's turger. Pom, pom, pom. So if my skin stays up, that means I'm fully, I'm dehydrated. If it flops back down, if it goes back almost immediately, I am fully hydrated. And this is one of the assessments of the, uh, if you notice a uh, nephrologist going in the room, talking to the patient, they're, they, they're pinching their arm, their hand, they're, pin they're pinching something. It's, uh, there's some, it's a subtle thing they do, but pay attention next time. It's kind of cool. And you're an output. So if my patient in the clinic, male patient, they can pee in a urinal, I can monitor their urine output. But if it's a female, the, if it's a female, they can go to the bathroom, they can use the hat. But if not, it's going to be very difficult to uh, monitor their urine output if, if, they're on a, if they go on a bedpan, say in the hospital. So in these cases, we're watching somebody's, uh, a patient's urine output closely, strictly, we, we are going to put a Foley in. We don't want to really want to do that because we're going to introduce, we may introduce some kind of bacteria to this patient, but it's, uh, does the benefit outweigh the risk? In this case, yes, so we can watch your, uh, so we can prevent your kidneys from failing or maybe no, because if we do introduce this bacteria inside your, your bladder, then you might die from it. So. It's a balancing act. Tough call. Another one, cyclophosphamide. That's another uh, chemo drug. Vincristine, Oncovin. This is a special, a different type of chemotherapy medication. I like my special medications because it's easy to remember because it's special. It's a chemo drug that does not cause bone marrow suppression. That's right. It's actually good to the bone, especially the bone marrow. But on the other hand, this is not a generic chemo medication. This can only be used on certain type of uh, cancers, probably a handful of them. And sometimes they use this in combination with the other uh, chemotherapy drugs. So now that, now that this medicine does not affect bone marrow suppression, remember these um, side effects or effects of bone marrow suppressions? Low RBCs, low platelets, low WBCs. That means these patients do not have that. They have normal, normal blood levels, normal RBCs. They have normal platelet levels. That means they're not bleeding. They're not a high risk for bleeding. And WBCs, they have the capacity, they have the capability to fight off any type of infection. Give them the flu, give them the cold. I don't know, give them whatever else. Give them AIDS, they'll fight it off. No, not, that's too much. Just the cold and the flu. But uh, so because their immune system is there and it's running at probably full capacity for them. And that's all I have for cancer medications. Stay with me. The end is near. We are about three weeks away into the grand finale of this section. And for some of you, it was nice. I think I met some of you guys last week. Nice meeting you, especially you in the lower right corner. Questions? Give me some questions. Yes, I'm going to create a, um, these are questions that was asked from the last earlier. Yes, I'm going to create a uh, study guide. I have not done them yet. Um, I'm working on it because uh, 
I'm still working on the uh, exam, on the finals exam. The, I said before, it's gonna be comprehensive. I kind of changed my mind because I, it's, now it's just gonna be the, uh, the new stuff we're talking about from, what is it? Started in GI to now cancer, malaria drugs to female reproductive drugs next week and some marijuana stuff like next week. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna throw in the, uh, the old stuff. Only because I'm being lazy. I don't want to have to go all the way back to the first slide, second slide. Not really. It's just easier for you guys to study, to focus on, on this thing instead of, what, looking at 12 different chapters or something like that. So you're welcome, by the way. Yes, you. Questions, other questions? No questions? Are you sure? If there's no questions, I'm going to stop recording, sign off, and I will see some of you guys this week. Late, actually, Thursday, Friday. P.S. That, uh, that simulation, it was actually fun. It wasn't scary. It was fun. It was good. It was a good time. Don't come in there being scared and it's good. Let's go with the flow. All right, that's it. I am checking out. See you guys next week. Actually, yeah, next week. I keep losing my mouse. Stop recording. Did anybody have it? I wasn't looking at the text here. Okay, there's no questions. Why didn't the text come out?